All right. We are hopping back on for a bit of a conversation and chat before David's talk. So, David, welcome. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? Yeah, perfect. And uh, look, I, I thought we'd take the opportunity just to have some general banter. We've um, we've known each other for a while and always got something good to, to chat about. So, um, yeah, welcome. And uh, for everyone else kind of watching, we'll actually get to the main talk still on time um, so that others can join for it. Uh, but we'll fill up the space with some some chat. So, David, I think the the key one that maybe you won't get to fill in in detail is the journey of Ursa and, and how you've kind of really gone down that startup path through Techstars. Um, would love for you to dig into that a little bit and, and kind of tell the journey on how you've pivoted or changed as time has gone on and innovation in drones has changed as well. Absolutely. And you and I actually have followed a somewhat similar journey, um, though our, our timing is a little bit different. But we both started from a cybersecurity background. Um, and I think that cybersecurity underpins an enormous amount of what is going on in the area of drones and autonomous systems and all the things that work with them, either to counter them or support them. And various people that we know or that are attending this conference um, are coming at it from different perspectives. My personal perspective was doing both digital forensics and incident response for Ernst & Young a number of years ago. And that gave me uh, some really strong insights into how to collect information from an individual device, uh, mobile phone, laptop, or whatever, uh, but also an entire ecosystem, uh, which was the incident response aspect of it. But it also taught me a lot about uh, threat intelligence, uh, figuring out what the adversary, adversary's objectives were and that helped inform what our defensive measures were and our response measures and things like that. So that's kind of my background. Um, five years ago, well, actually, while I was still at EY, I looked at drones and I said, you know, these things are really cool. How do I apply what I'm getting paid to do to this thing that I want to do? And it really was, okay, how do we extract information from these things if we need to go analyze them? Um, so I started working on UAV forensics uh, if you look at my SANS presentations, I think the first one I did was like 2014 or 2015. Um, right. So yeah, I was very early into it. I'm still very early into it. The demand for UAV forensics is still relatively small. Um, there are some organizations which are doing a really good job. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection um, for inside the, the United States is one of the best, uh, has one of the best UAV forensics uh, capabilities within the U.S. government. Um, there are some smaller organizations that are doing it um, as well, but it's not their main forte. Um, so we have been developing software, uh, actually a SaaS platform that is capable of doing UAV forensics, but there's really not a lot of money there. So to your point, you know, pivoting. So we got into Techstars, which is one of the accelerators. Um, there are a bunch of other ones out there now. Um, most of those accelerators are designed to help you not necessarily write a really good pitch or run a business. They're really teaching you how to figure out what it is that, you, that has value to customers and enough value that they will actually pay you for it. So there's customer discovery and all this other stuff. So we went through Techstars. We discovered that the United States Air Force was actually interested in UAV forensics, um, got a fair bit of R&D money out of that. Um, but again, even that request was still too early. There wasn't a lot of demand within the Air Force for doing it. And then COVID hit and a lot of R&D money drew, dried up, a lot of VC money dried up. And so we were really spending time looking around and saying, okay, what else can we do? Um, there were some opportunities to pivot. We were looking at smart cities. Uh, somebody said, can you instrument uh, propane gas cylinders? Um, because they produce telemetry and we ingest telemetry. Um, that particular company, as a side, uh, just sold their entire business off to a much larger company. Uh, so that actually turned out to be a successful effort, but just not one that we wanted to do. We stayed with it. We stayed within the sort of defense, law enforcement community, uh, and where we've pivoted to, though it's really not a strong pivot is looking at counter UAS data um, and really trying to do it 
um, as you do and others in this sort of consulting space do it from an unbiased third party perspective. Um, and wow, I think I that, yeah. yeah, I was going to touch on that. What, what, what does that mean in this industry and, and, uh, what has your experience been so far as an unbiased third party? So this comes the, this perspective, unbiased third party, um, and actually trusted usually gets involved in that statement. It's usually a trusted unbiased third party, um, and EY and the other big consulting firms. This is one of their foundational principles, and it's one of mine. And I think it's one of yours as well. Um, the vendors obviously have a particular perspective on what they are bringing to the table, and they are trying to sell and promote their product. And that's there's nothing wrong with that. That's their business. Um, the customers have a particular bias. Um, it may be because somebody's in the organization that favors something. It may be for a variety of reasons. Um, my experience from EY and working on this now is that there is a great demand for uh, companies such as ours and yours that understand both the customer, how to work with the customer and understand the customer's needs for systems to do forensics or counter UAS or uh, cybersecurity, and who can also understand the various vendors' capabilities at a level of detail that allows that consulting firm or that particular tool that does this sort of work to properly represent not just the vendors to the customers, but also the customers to the vendors. Um, and it's really important to maintain that unbiased aspect. Once the you're perceived as having some particular um, favoritism towards a particular vendor, and particularly a financial incentive, um, then whatever recommendations you make pro or con for that vendor or any other vendor are now colored by that particular financial benefit um, or other benefit. And so walking that fine line and being somebody that people on, in the industry can come to and say, hey, look, what do you think about either this use case or this particular approach to the problem or this particular vendor and being able to answer that in a way that people trust that you're not motivated by anything other than the facts, um, that's really important. Yeah, that's a big one because, you know, that might mean short term income if you can make those vendor relationships or, or deals um, and you get that kickback if you can make a recommendation. Uh, but, it, it you know, it helps so much more if there is transparency. And, you know, we have tested these systems from an independent perspective. We have our own framework. You know, we never get kickbacks from a certain vendor, but we're able to tell you what we think works best, both in your environment or maybe for your geography or for your regulation. And these days, it's so easy to, to go and look at it from, you know, as even Garrick mentioned before, a technology standpoint, what works best. And then you realize there's so many other factors that regulation might mean a system that's not as technically effective might actually be a better solution for them. Or in some cases, a human standard operating procedure without even having a, a counter drone system might be the solution. And even in other cases, you know, their budget might not have the required need for something else they can do. Um, so we see that all the time. And look, I think there's one question that, that comes to mind because, you know, you, yourself, you come from EY. Um, I was working at BAE Systems previously. And my question is, why do you think this has to be a boutique or a niche sector uh, for some of these firms? Why aren't all the big four, the big guys currently doing this type of work yet? Is it just still emerging or do you think there's something else to it? I'm actually in conversations with one of the big four about taking what we're doing and providing it through them. So I have been trying to talk to the various big four for the last five years. I don't think there was a sufficient revenue stream associated with this type of work to interest them. Um, you've been in the similar positions I have. It's like it, and nothing against the big four or other consulting firms, but there's a certain threshold of revenue required for them to actually engage anything. And this has not been a sufficient problem to generate that level of revenue. Uh, the particular firm that I'm talking to now is looking at federal US federal government contracts. Those have the potential of generating the revenue that will drive this type of demand. The other thing is um, sort of on the, on the demand side, 
the what we are talking about is really sort of a startup space problem. Um, there are people such as you and I that are passionate about understanding how UAVs and counter UAV systems work. Um, and so we're willing to invest sweat equity into making something of this. Uh, we are out there on the cutting edge. And now uh, that we have done that and the, the industry is now saying, okay, there's a demand for unbiased third parties that understand how these systems can be deployed and operated um, and that there's su sufficient volume of UAVs out there that are both uh, normal hobby or commercial, but also behaving in a malicious manner. Now there is uh, interest coming up on those large consulting firms saying, hey, wait a second, uh, our customers are now asking us, can we provide this service? And so I think that over the next four or five years, um, and probably even sooner, we're going to see uh, autonomous systems and UAVs and counter UAS uh, uh, programs within some of the larger consulting firms. But um, based on my experience at some of these firms, I think that some of the best capabilities will still come out of boutique firms such as yours and ours. Um, mm. Because we are laser focused on this. And one of the problems that the consulting firms have is that when the team that is working on a particular problem area doesn't have work to do, they don't want those people sitting on the bench. They want them generating revenue. And so they will get tasked with doing something else. And then they aren't keeping their skill set up. Whereas you and I and other firms such as ours, if there's a quiet time, we're going to be out doing research. We're going to be out giving presentations. We're going to be out making sure that we are keeping our capabilities fresh, uh, keeping up with the latest research and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's actually funny you say that because this is the the first GDSN that I myself haven't given a talk. And, you know, it is something where you go to give a presentation and you start a, a research hypothesis and you end up not just with a talk, but some new research and something that you've developed and found along the road, way. And sometimes it will end up becoming a, a type of framework or something that you can use off. So I, I get that. And I think when what you call bench time in a, in a consultant company usually ends up being R&D time <laughs> in, a, in a startup. Um, um, and look, I want to touch on that point because this is something, you know, where drones and counter drones isn't just your your typical cybersecurity where you can have a, a, a civilian approach, let's say. There is a large military style of, of theme with counter drones. So when you come from a startup compared to a company, perception matters a lot. So in your own journey, how many times have you had have you had to try and give off the perception uh, of not a startup versus the benefits of a startup being, you know, agile and elite and, and, you know, that kind of thing. Can you talk me through that a little bit? That's a huge challenge. And there are people in the ecosystem that I came up through that are addressing this as a uh, nonprofit alliance, because while the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense is really trying to in, be innovative and accept and embrace innovation via startups, they have a real hard time doing that. And so you they want uh, oftentimes they want to look at a well-established firm and because they know that they've got you know a hundred years of experience, they've got all the administrative support um, and things like that. And so it's a real challenge to walk that line. I think it's crucially important, in the space that we're working in that we're talking about and that the audience is here for to be innovative um the counter uas systems are rapidly evolving because the threat is rapidly evolving and that threat comes not just from the malicious actors figuring out how to better use it but it's coming from academia it's coming from the commercial world it's coming from the hobbyists because these are dual use tools so as much as Raytheon or BAE or Lockheed Martin or whatever would like to say that they're innovative, their innovation is over like five year chunks. Whereas a typical startup is innovating in sometimes weekly, but monthly or six months time, time period. And if a law enforcement firm, a law enforcement agency or the DOD or a consulting firm comes to us and says, hey, we like what you're doing. Can you adjust it to go solve this particular use case? we have the experience and we have the administrative support to very rapidly say yes we will go produce a proof of concept for you and then work with you on sort of like an agile model where 
we start working, moving that forward on a weekly basis to, to get where you want to do. And your typical large DOD contractor just cannot innovate at that speed. And if we want to keep up with the threat actors, we need to innovate. And you've seen this in cybersecurity also. It's just, it's got to move at very quick pace. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, look, you, you talk about solving problems or finding out what some of those problems are. Uh, you mentioned before about the U.S. Customs and Border Control, how they've, they've, they're doing pretty good at, at say, forensics. Now, uh, I won't get you to say anything sensitive or, or classified there, but <laughs> if if they're great at forensics right now, what are still the main problems they're facing? Uh, obviously, your field is evaluation, but what are the other problems that they're still unsolved that maybe there are other startup possibilities out there? I think the biggest problems that the government entities have are actually not problems that startups can solve, unfortunately. Um, there are two big aspects. One is procurement. Their procurement models sometimes require six months or a year to get from, hey, we like your idea to here's the money, let's get started on it. And the other one's regulatory. Um, there is a demand for counter you. I'm just going to, there's, there's, clearly a lot of malicious UAV activity on the southern border. Our national ability to detect, track, neutralize, investigate those malicious UAVs is greatly hampered by the regulatory environment in which we're operating domestically. If you're operating in a war zone where there's a declared war and the, the combatants on either side of it are very clear, then your ability to deploy counter UAS systems is much easier. Doing that domestically in Australia, in Germany, in the United States or whatever, uh, the regulatory environment um, has got to catch up with the demand for these systems. And we have not yet seen the compelling event as it is that says we really need to be able to deploy uh, effective counter UAS systems because this bad thing happened, but we're going to get there at some point. Mm, okay. So I wish I wish that startups could solve the procurement and regulatory problems. Um, I think that the, the other ones that startups are already working on are, you know, better SD, better software defined radios, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, visualization, all the sort of stuff that we're working on already. Mm, okay. And look, um, I think we've still got time for one more question before we go on. And this one's more close to my heart, but I know we've discussed it a few times. And that's around, you know, threat intelligence, right? So there's a, a key idea that more sharing, just like your cyber threat intelligence of incidents or reports, say nationwide or to a central governing body, could in fact aid and enrich counter UAS systems in the way they're, they're focusing on what's next. Um, now, it can be very hard to get counter UAS vendors to provide that information to a central body uh, or for their clients to actually sign off on allowing that data to be shared. Uh, it's not like we've got a standard framework like Styx uh, or Taxi or something like that. So if I were to ask you what you see in terms of the future, do you see counter UAS vendors and their clients being made mandatory to share drone incidents and detection? And if so, what do you think that will look like? I think that is probably one of the biggest challenges facing us. And I think I'm really glad you brought it up. We, I mean, I do work for Interpol. I do work for a couple, I'm in conversations with a couple of UN agencies about things around this space, but also work with local law enforcement, federal law enforcement. They all, they all really need to have a broad perspective of what's going on with malicious UAVs. Um, and you are doing a really good job of trying to get some of that information out there. Um, but you've also hit on the problem is that the vendors and oftentimes their, their clients don't want that information published. Sometimes for very good reasons, you know, they, and if it's sometimes, uh, if that information is published, it might incentivize other malicious actors to say, oh, wait a second, you know, we should also be targeting this thing. And I have a great deal of respect for all the counter UAS vendors. Um, I think that they are working in a very difficult industry. Uh, the revenue streams are not matching up with expectations, all of that. Um, they're all putting out very interesting, capable products. But they, for valid business reasons, 
do not want to share how effective or not effective their systems are with anybody that includes their customers, it includes their potential customers. They don't want that. They, they would like everybody to understand how effective their systems are, but they really don't want anybody to understand how ineffective their systems might be. And so that sharing is very difficult. But we also see this in all the federal governments uh, all over the world. You know, there are stovepipes where one agency has information and they don't want to share it with another one. So I think there's two sets of problems. Um, I think that there needs to be some mechanism established uh, and it would be like an ISAC most likely where there's a trusted unbiased third party organization where people in that industry, uh, oil and gas or whatever, share threat intelligence amongst themselves to better support their industry. And so build it up so they're mutually supporting their own industries and then build some umbrella over top of that, which then gets possibly anonymized threat intelligence out of those ISACs and moves that up to the federal level. Within the federal governments and local governments and trying to get law enforcement to share with military and, you know, I think there's 15 intelligence agencies in the United States alone at the federal level. Solving that problem, that's beyond you and me, <laughs> not our gig. At a higher level. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so David, uh, we're, we're right on time. So what I might get you to do is uh, use the share button on um, in StreamYard to get your slides ready so that we can um, place them up on screen very soon. And we'll kick off to everyone else that's just tuned in. We'll kick off in about 30 seconds or so. Uh, so appreciate the, the chat as well um, as we've been able to do. And uh, David, let me know if you have any issues sharing your slides. Can you see it now? Uh, not so much yet. Um, maybe, so using the share within StreamYard. I thought I had. There we go. I can start to see it on the screen. And we've there we got go. It. So, what I'll do is uh, I'll hop off screen, but look, I really appreciate the chat. And again, appreciate you coming on um, again for the GDSN. And we're really grateful to have you as our, our keynote, as we always have. Um, and just appreciate the time. So thanks so much and go ahead and kick off. Sounds good. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I really enjoyed participating the last time um, that we did this. And you've got a great set of presenters and you've got a great audience and that the opportunity to engage in conversations with peers and with uh, people that are facing these challenges is tremendously valuable. Um, none of us are experts in, well, we are experts to a point, but none of us have learned everything that we need to know. We are constantly learning. And some of that comes from the sort of research and development that you and I were talking about but a lot of it comes from conversations. Um, and we were talking about that trusted third party. We were also talking, talking about intelligence sharing, participating in uh, opportunities such as this and in your Slack channel and via your platform is a really great opportunity for everybody who's interested in these problems and contributing to solving these problems uh, to have a voice and to help each other learn. Um, and so really excited about that and very appreciative of everybody who's participating. Um, if you just joined us and missed the first 15, the 15 minutes just a minute ago, um, my name is David Kovar. Um, I founded and run a company, company called URSA uh, and URSA stands for Unmanned Robotic Systems Analysis. Um, our focus is on making sense of the behavior of unmanned systems and in particular UAVs. Um, that's my phone number, that's my email address. Um, the, this deck will be available um, at the end of the presentation. Um, there's a URL in here uh, that goes to a series of blog posts that I did on this topic. So everything that you're about to see, you're gonna get all these slides, but if you go to that URL, you're gonna get a lot more information that digs into all the various aspects of what I'm about to talk about. Um, you're welcome to reuse this information. The only thing I ask is that you cite um, our effort. Um, and if you are interested in having conversations about it, 
uh, do let me know. Um, I'm happy to engage in those conversations. My background, um, I've been doing digital forensics and cybersecurity investigations for a very long time now. Uh, for those not familiar with the terms or digital forensics, from my perspective, is about extracting information from individual devices and doing a really deep dive onto that device. Cybersecurity and particularly incident response investigations are really about extracting enormous volumes of information from a very large environment. So a Fortune 50 company, for example, things like that. I've done both of those and other cybersecurity really work. And that really helped inform what we're doing now, which is extracting information from individual UAVs or counter UAS systems, but also extracting information from the very much larger environment. So 50 counter UAS systems scattered around the United States um, and UAVs that are um, found or otherwise uh, the evidence is extracted from them all over the world and bringing all that together to help do trend analysis, threat analysis, all sorts of other things. I've got five plus years of private sector UAV forensics and analysis. Um, I suspect that puts me in the top, some very small percentage in the, in the world. Um, I've really been looking at doing this stuff for a very long time. Uh, there are other out, people out there that are as good as I am or better. Um, I'm not saying that I'm the best, I'm just saying this is a passion of mine and um, I'm very excited and thrilled to be able to participate in the community and doing this sort of work. Um, in the lead up to this, we were talking about trusted unbiased third parties. Um, that is very important to me and to our firm and to the people I work with. Um, we have a strong desire to understand and to show how systems work. And we try to do this in a supportive manner that does not represent the financial or other interests of any particular party. We've been developing a general purpose telemetry analysis platform uh, for analyzing and visualizing telemetry data. Um, and we can currently extract information from a wide variety of UAVs, from counter UAS systems, from ADSB data, which is manned aircraft telemetry, AIS data, which is, um, manned, uh, which is uh, marine telemetry data. And we're looking at how to intersect that and sort of tell stories of not just how UAVs are operating, but how all of these systems are interoperating and relating to each other. So that's the end of the marketing pitch. Um, what are we here, here to talk about? Um, counter UAS systems are a really big thing. Um, and they have been for probably five years now. Um, there's been an enormous amount of VC money invested in them. Um, and in 2019, Bard College did a report saying that there were over 250 counter UAS products on the market. So that number's only gone up since then. Um, the problem is figuring out which ones, which which of those systems work and you have to define what work means. And then you got to figure out, okay, against what threats and in what environment. So you really need to have a formal test and evaluation process that helps guide your procurement process. And so that's, what, that's the primary thing that we're here to talk about. Um, given my background, it's important for me to remind everybody that test and evaluation and forensics sit on that same foundation. Both of, the, both of those efforts really need to understand how the systems are performing and to be able to document that. They're working towards different ends um, and they're looking at different data, but they sit on a similar foundation. So I mentioned during the lead up to this that we were way out in front of the bleeding edge of doing UAV forensics when we started. Um, we're out in front of the need for counter UAS forensics as well. Um, the number of shoot downs or the number of times where counter UAS systems have interacted with a malicious UAV that has led to some sort of court case or prosecution or whatever is very, very small at the moment. Um, I think it's reasonable to assume that over the next couple of years, as counter UAS systems start coming online within the military, within the law enforcement, also, but also within the civilian sector, you know, protecting oil and gas and things like that, that we're gonna have more opportunities or more um, cases where there is a counter UAS involved with um, a malicious UAV 
and that it's going to go in front of a judge and a jury. And so when that happens or before that happens, we need to know how to do forensics, digital forensics on not just the UAV that was involved, but on all the other systems that were participating in that so we can tell a full story. So that's why counter UAS forensics. If you, are, if you want to test and evaluate counter UAS systems, there's an enormous amount of work involved in generating the data required to do the analysis. The analysis, while very difficult, is just a very small part of a much larger effort. Um, I was just involved in a conversation with some people on a Facebook group that were about to do some counter UAS testing um, that reminded me of this particular point. Um, there's a lot of time and a lot of prep work involved in doing all the logistics, getting the people there, getting everything cited, uh, making sure that there's enough uh, network bandwidth for all the traffic that you're about to do, that you've got real-time communications between all the uh, participating groups, that you've got enough channels available so that everybody's not talking over each other. You need to have a well-documented and practiced set of flight plans, and those flight plans should represent the threat models that you want to test against, and you need to have people who are capable of executing those flight plans over and over again in exactly the same way whenever possible. Um, and you need to have regulatory approval, um, not just for the counter UAS systems, because they may be emitting in certain frequencies, which are um, may interfere with other systems in the area, but also for the flight plans. If you think that the threat actor is going to fly within the regulatory envelope, then you don't need regulatory approval for your flight tests. But if you think that the threat actor may come in at 5,000 feet and then drop down on top of your site, um, that is probably in violation, or that particular flight test is probably in violation of the regulatory environment. And so you might wanna get a waiver for doing that. So there's an enormous amount of work involved in doing this stuff right. Um, I'm only gonna really talk about the data collection analysis part of it. If you're interested in the other aspects of it, let me know, happy to have conversations about that as well. What are we trying to accomplish? <laughs> um, does your counter UAS system do what you expect? Um, the sort of informal way is exactly what I just did. In marketing speak, it's really important that the vendors demonstrate in a quantifiable manner how their systems perform in a variety of environments against a range of targets and flight profiles and over time as the hardware, software, and configurations evolve. Um, and as Mike and I were talking in the lead up to this, this is a sort of information that vendors need to be able to share with people and that it's very hard to get them to share. I would say to all the vendors, and they know this, but I'm gonna say it anyhow, that the more that they are able to share this information in a standardized form, the easier it is for the people doing procurement to say, yes, we understand what your system is and is not capable of it, and it aligns or does not align with our use cases. So a little bit more free-flowing information between on both sides, everybody's got to be a little bit more transparent, is going to help um, uh, with the procurement process. It's also important to share information from event to event to event. Um, the, most of these counter UAS systems are based on some sort of computer system, often with a software-defined radio, and there are lots of ways that that hardware and the software evolves over time. So the test that you did six months ago in the Arizona desert may be very different than the test that you're doing six months later on a Pacific island, but having the information from both of them helps inform the end user and the vendor how these different systems behave in different environments, which is very important to everybody participating. Another way of looking at what we're trying to accomplish is, can we do this? And you're gonna say, okay, what is this? Um, this is an analysis of the UAVs track versus, sorry, the UAVs track versus where the counter UAS system thought the UAV was at any particular point in time. So in the upper left, um, we're comparing the counter UAS's perception, which is the red, versus the TISB track. And the TISB is essentially the ground truth, and we'll get into that. 
Um, so it shows that the UAV, and I, I mapped this from the real world into ECEF uh, Cartesian coordinates uh, for doing some stuff. So that's why it looks as it does. So the UAV flew, in a, uh, flew a little bit sideways and then it flew in a straight line, whereas the counter UAS system thought that it was wandering around. Upper right, it's just showing where it was flying um, in the real world. Uh, the lower two charts are on the left bottom. Um, it's a two-dimensional and three-dimensional error over time. Um, early on in the flight and all the way, it was actually a fair bit of error, uh, 250 meters off. Towards the end of the flight, uh, the error margin was down under 150 meters, and then it got down to around 20 meters. The chart on the right hand side tells a little bit of that story. Um, as the UAV got closer to the sensor, it got more accurate. And there's a variety of other similar sorts of analysis that you can do. The take home point here is that you need to be able to do this sort of analysis. And to do this sort of analysis, you need two things. You need to know what questions you want to ask and you need to gather the information required to go answer those questions. One of the things you need to understand uh, or you need to agree on is what does counter UAS effectiveness mean? In the military, and I'm oversimplifying, so bear with me, um, counter UAS effectiveness is essentially, did it stop the threat? There's one or more UAVs coming at us. Did we manage to stop them before they uh, had their intended effect? Whether that's ISR or dropping munitions or whatever, did we stop it? If, if we did, if, it, if the UAV is one mile out and has been lazed or somehow or other stopped, then the system was effective and the nuance is less important. As Mike and I were talking in the lead up again, in the civilian space or when you're not on the battlefield, the, there's a lot of other factors that come into play that help determine what counter US effectiveness means. Uh, some of those things that affect on our rules of engagement, um, the U.S. military within the ground uh, bounds of the United States are has a very different rules of engagement than they do if they're in a war zone. Uh, the regulatory environments are very restrictive, and Mike and I were talking about that in the lead up as well. Um, we have counter U.S. capabilities uh, in the United States that would enable us to stop a lot more UAVs coming across the southern border if we had the regulatory approval to do so. Um, or they would have the capability of stopping UAVs flying over um, a nuclear power plant. And there's a bunch of great um, articles um, from an organization called The Drive about UAVs surveilling nuclear facilities for the last couple of years in the United States. We're not able to stop them because of the regulatory environment. Um, we want to collect evidence. We want to go to court with it. If you laze the UAV out of the sky and melt it down to slag, there's not a lot of evidence left. Um, the cost of the systems uh, is a big uh, factor um, and the fact that we're operating in non-battlefield conditions. So all these go into determining what the effectiveness of the counter UAS system is. Um, this, I'm gonna talk through this slide, but I think it's really important that if you're interested in this topic, uh, pick up my presentation, uh, read through the slide, and if you're doing tests or thinking about doing tests, or you just want to understand what the counter US systems are capable of doing, read through these, all these points and really internalize them and talk them over with the people that you're working with, whether it's your team or the vendor or whatever. So you're all on the same page about what these terms mean. Um, this is a great thing to do around a tabletop exercise. Um, it's, it's, just, it's a great, team building exercise and also really important for accomplishing before you go off and start doing selection. The first one is detection. So what does it mean to detect the UAV? Um, it, this is a pretty good de definition. It's like when the counter UAS system reports that there's an object and it says, and I, I want to emphasize that it includes birds and commercial planes and its view is a detection. It's, it detected something out there and that's it. The next step helps refine what that it is and starts getting into the countering part of it. 
So once you've detected it and you could have, I've got radar uh, images where there's one in UAV and there are flocks of birds around it. So there's an enormous number of detections, but there's only one UAV. Classify. So once you detect it, a counter UAS system with or without support from its operator or other systems determines that the detection is a small UAS. So it may be that the operator is sitting there with a pair of field glasses and looking out along the bearing that the counter UAS system says and looks out and sees a, it's a UAV coming in. That's still classification. We're not saying it's got to be classified by the counter UAS system. Um, it just, it does need to be classified before you move on to the next step. Um, there are a lot of counter UAS systems out there which are integrated systems. So you've got a RF detector, an acoustic detector, and then you've got uh, some sort of optical system that is slewed along the bearing to look at where uh, the other system is saying there's a, there's, a, there's a detection out here and the optical system using some sort of visual analysis or even the human looking at this image says, oh, okay, that is a UAB. So classification needs to happen. It is really important to locate that object in space. Um, if you're defending your perimeter, uh, you're a prison or a nuclear facility or whatever, your rules of engagement, um, your response plan, all that depends on where exactly is this incoming object? Is it three miles out and holding steady? Um, it may not be a threat or it may be doing ISR. Um, is it coming in at 200 miles per hour, uh, 10 feet off the, 10 meters, sorry, uh, we're national goal, uh, 10 meters off the deck um, and coming directly at us? That helps guide us towards what's the intent here. Um, one of the sort of truths of the doing test and evaluation is that if you're bearing, if you're if you're bearing to the UAV is off by five degrees at three miles, that's a lot less important than if you're off by five degrees at 50 feet. So that's one of those analysis parts is like, if you just say, okay, the accuracy in terms of bearing accuracy is 5%, that's great, but you need to know whether it's 5% at what different distances to really put that 5% that into context. So that location and getting the accuracy of that location is more and more important as it gets closer in. Uh, the location could be a three-dimensional point, you know, that long out. Um, it could be a circle or sphere, so it's somewhere within this sphere. Um, it could be a line or a bearing. Uh, radar generally produces azimuth and elevation or other forms. So understand the accuracy, but also understand what that location is. <clears throat> um, tracks. Track is basically a compilation of reclosure rep location reports over a period of time. Um, make sure that the track consists of only the location reports for the same object, and so you're not confusing objects together. Um, the second sentence in that definition is important. Tracks can be displayed as a line or a sequence of dots. The lines are really pretty. Um, there's two big problems with using tra uh, displaying a track as a line. The first is a classic two points make a straight line. If you only have two detections and two locations and they span five miles, you're going to have this beautiful straight line that shows that the UAV was flying in a straight line for five miles. If you switch that from a line to a sequence of dots, you will then immediately understand that what you have is only two detection points and you wonder what the heck was going on in between those points. So keep in mind how you're visualizing the data because certain types of visualization will cause the observer to, make, to come to conclusions that you may not want them to come to or that actually work against uh, your ultimate objective. It's imp I think that it's important for people to deploy counter UAS systems, even if they don't mitigate. Um, understanding what's going on in your airspace, understanding what the threats are, understanding all that sort of stuff is important. So if your counter UAS system only does detect, classify, locate, and track, um, then that's pretty good unto itself. Um, 
However, if you want, ultimately, you're going to want to mitigate. And so there are a variety of forms of mitigation. You can negate it, you can interdict it, you can neutralize it, you can destroy it, you can send it home. All of these things are a form, for, form of mitigation. It's really important to be able to identify the point at which the counter UAS system was actually mitigating the UAS from accomplishing its mission. If the counter UAS system says we are now jamming um, the UAV, you might say that's the mitigation. But if the UAV continues on its course for another 30 seconds before that jamming actually has an effect on it, the important that both those points are important. When the mitigation when the mitigation effort started is important, but when the mitigation effort actually took effect is also very important. So when you're doing mitigation, make sure you're tracking both of those. If we say a system detected UAS, most of us will understand it. But it's also important to understand where all of this information is presented. It could be in a log file, a user interface, audible alert, what was detected, all these things. So understanding, okay, we detected it is important. Understanding how that communication is, is conveyed to the observer or the operator, but also to the system doing the recording is also very important. So understand, agree on the terms, understand what they mean, understand how that information is communicated. I mentioned TSP bucks, um, TSP devices. Uh, TSP stands for time, space, position, information. So it is a device that's assigned to a a accurately and sometimes very accurately record where that device is in time, in space, and also its position, sometimes orientation. Um, for counter UAS testing, it's a definitive source of truth on which everything else depends. All of these UAVs are, have their own log files, which show where they are. Uh, you can get them from DGI, you can get them from Pixhawk. All of them have, record this information. A couple problems. One is sometimes it's hard to get that information off. Uh, DGI encodes and makes it difficult to get the log files off. But the other problem with them, two other problems with them are related to the fact that um, though that position information oftentimes isn't terribly accurate. Um, I've seen, multiple sources of position information in a DGI aircraft uh, essentially disagree with each other because some of it comes from the barometric sensor, comes some comes from the GPS, some comes from um, uh, keeping tr uh, sort of predicting where it's going to be. All that stuff is challenging. And also the GPS may not be terribly accurate. So having an external source of truth that's mounted onto the UAV to collect this information I think is really important. Um, if your GPS uh, on board the aircraft is only accurate to 40 meters, then any conclusion you come to about how accurate the counter UAS system can never be more accurate than 40 meters. Um, the other problem is that if you're jamming the UAV system, then all of its time space position information, it becomes suspect as soon as that effect um, starts coming in as, as soon as the counter US system starts having an effect on the UAV. This is one of those reference slides. Um, you know, if you're interested in TSP pucks, um, and by the way, there are not a lot out there. Um, we developed a prototype uh, for the US Air Force and we're working on getting funding for a production model. Um, this is just some notes on what you're looking for in a TSP device. Um, it needs to be fought. fundamentally. Oftentimes, once you do a test, you don't have an opportunity to recreate it. Uh, you can't fly the aircraft again. You know, there are other aircraft you need to fly, the vendors need to leave, whatever. If you don't collect this information correctly the first time, getting it again later is hard. So making the TSP POC, TSP device as fault tolerant as possible is really, really important. Um, it should be sufficiently weather resistant and impact resistant to survive the normal operating environment. Um, if you're going to shoot the UAV down and it's going to fall to earth from 300 meters, the TSP POC should survive it. Um, you should have a real-time data link when possible, which helps mitigate the problems of shooting it down, but still make it fault tolerant, make it uh, physically robust. Um, that's most of those first set of bullet points. It's got to be accurate. It's got to be in some sort of common format. 
it's got to be trusted. Uh, you want to reduce the swap. Uh, swap stands for size, weight, and power. Um, I won't bring it up. I've got a really bad Tispy puck with me. Um, it was very large. It had an impact on the flight performance of the UAV. It increased, increased the radar cross section. Um, you don't want, you want to do as little as possible to affect the flight characteristics and the physical characteristics of the UAV that you're mounting on this on. Uh, the power should be independent of the target. You don't want to draw power from the target either. Um, whenever possible, provide a real-time downlink. Um, that means that you're getting the data. It provides you with situational awareness, which is really helpful from running these sort of things. But also, if the uh, Tispy puck ends up in the river or it gets lazed or whatever, you still get the data. So that's important. Um, the data link should not interfere with or be affected by the county US systems in the law of the exercise. Um, if you have a 933 megahertz uh, control frequency and you're using the same 933 megahertz uh, frequency for downlinking your data um, and somebody jams that link as a part of the mitigation, you just lost your data connection, uh, your TISP link connection as well. Human observers. We want to fully automate counter UAS testing evaluation um, because humans are error prone. Uh, converting analog data, my speaking or my writing notes down into digital form is hard, but it's really important when doing this sort of stuff. Um, there's a lot of information that's not available or not recorded by the electronic sensors. Um, you know, seeing the UAV wobble in flight, for example, when a mitigation uh, takes effect is an important thing to note because um, it may not get captured in the digital data or may be hard to get to. Um, recording when the audible alert is uh, is put out on for the operator is, is important. Um, viewing the user interface for the county UAS is important. And it's not in here, but it's in the long form blog post. I would recommend that if you've got counter UAS system displays, that if at all possible, you do a video capture of that. Because then when you've got questions about what was the observer seeing two months later when you're doing the data analysis, you can go look at the video and say, OK, this is exactly what was going on. So worth keeping in mind. That's where the human observers come in. They can help us answer how many UAVs were actually in the air. Um, I was participating in an exercise where uh, there was a lot of confusion about how many UAVs were actually available to be detected by the counter UAS system. Use, get the humans to record this and um, do it accurately. Which TISP puck was on which aircraft? That's very important to know which track was going with it, which aircraft. What aircraft went in the river? Did the counter US system detect the UAV, mitigate? All this sort of stuff is, stuff is, is information that's really important to have a human also record and capture in some sort of digital form. Counter US data sources. Um, there are a lot of sources. And which source you want to use for counter US test and evaluation or forensics depends on a lot of different factors. And I'm not going to tell you that one is best for your circumstances. You're going to need to figure out based on what you're trying to accomplish, your resources you have available, you know, which one of these sources you want to work with. The four primary data sources are the vendor log files. So these are computer systems. They are generating voluminous logs. Um, if you've done incident response or digital forensics, you're familiar with this. Um, this is very high fidelity information. It's not, it's logged in real time, but it's not available in real time. It's really poorly documented. You know, some engineer is going to add some new uh, log message. And if, if it gets documented, it's months later. And so subject matter expertise is often required to really understand these log files. However, it's a really great source of information. Most of the vendors have APIs, uh, application programming interfaces. Um, you can tie into that and get a lot of real-time information uh, from the system. Um, the ve it's vendor curated in the sense that the vendor is, pre is presenting to the client, uh, the software client, information in a form and only the information the vendor wants to share. But that is really the information you're probably looking for for doing test evaluation. It is done in real time, which is really important. Um, it is transient, though. So if you want to preserve the information that's available via the API, you, the test and evaluation people, should log it um, and preserve it. 
Um, that API is well documented, it's user friendly, all that sort of stuff. So in general, if you can tie into this, that's the best option. Um, writing, support, developing a client for doing all the logging, uh, using the vendor's API does require software engineering, test and validation of that process. So it's non-trivial to get right. Um, there's a sort of standards discussion to have around that. The vendor user interface is incredibly highly curated. Um, the vendor is defining the experience and what information is shared and how it's shared. It's real time. It is transient. If you want to preserve it, you've got to do a video recording of it. And it's the ultimate user experience. As I said, preserving this information to understand what the user experience is really important. It may turn out that in the vendor log files, it says we detected, we classified, uh, we tracked, and we mitigated, but none of that information may have gotten to the user interface. And so ultimately the system failed because the operator didn't get that information. So if you have the resources available, combining those two things together gives you a much better context. Um, standard and proprietary integration layers are where I think that if we wanna do standardized um, counter US test and evaluation at scale, we should do. Um, there are in the US uh, two major command and control layers, uh, one's FAD C2, the other one's Medusa. Um, basically, these are very, very well designed and standardized ways for various sensors to communicate with each other and with control systems. And so if all of your sensors can participate in one of those layers, in one of those layers, and you can pull the information out of that, um, it's probably the best source of information um, because those standards define, make sure that all the data is normalized. Um, it makes sure you're getting all the same information from all the sensors, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you're playing at the DOD level, that's easy. If you're doing sort of working down the consumer commercial level um, and in the sub $100,000 sensor level, it's probably a little bit harder. Hopefully that will change or it's be able. Counting US systems generate enormous volumes of data. A lot of it, is of no interest to many of us. Um, and different use cases will really de determine what data you're looking at. Um, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, which of those four you choose is likely to be obvious. Uh, my, the exercise I was working on, we worked with the vendor log files. It was a great experience. It had some challenges. Uh, we had to do a lot of normalization. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it's worth noting that the easier it is to obtain the data, the farther you are away from the unvarnished truth. So just keep that in mind. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, I'm gonna start moving a little more quickly through this. If your raw data is flawed, there's, not, there's no hope for meaningful analysis, you probably can't go collect it again. Um, if your data is questionable, um, if there's doubt about how accurate it is, then the analysts are gonna spend a lot of time making sure getting rid of all those questions. Um, so that's not time well spent. Get it right the first time. If it's poorly organized, you know, you drop it on a thumb drive and you don't upload that thumb drive to the right place, all that sort of stuff, um, then it, the data is useless. You've got to make it so it's available to people and that they can trust it. And then there's normalization. If it's not in the same format, units, geospatial reference models, all that, then a lot of resources are required to normalize it before any meaningful analysis is done. So get the normalization right at the outset. Data normalization, um, to really compare this information, and we saw why we want to compare it. We want to compare where the counter UAS system thought the target was versus where the target really was. We must use common frames of reference. Um, there are simple ways of doing this. There are very sophisticated adjustments. Um, <clears throat> the effort is to bring in the common frame of reference. At a bare minimum, you should use the same time zones. Um, I recommend UTC. Um, and reference model WGS84, not long altitude for physical location all participating systems. It's worth noting that radar systems will not generate uh, lat long altitude. They'll generate uh, bearing and as, uh, elevation. So you need to have some, some way of converting that information into that common frame of reference. Uh, this is a slide that you should uh, pick up the deck afterwards and digest. Um, it's talking about all the data collection steps. Um, on the left side, it's what we had to do before the event even kicked off. In the middle, it's all the data collection that we did during the event. 
And then there was all the data collection after. So there's a lot of different elements of data collection that we had to get right for everything to come together correctly. And so this is part of the prep work, but this is also part of the, if we get better at sharing what worked for one exercise with other people, then the next exercise will be easier to uh, easier to uh, do and will generate better data. So this is the sort of thing that we can all collaborate on and get help everybody else get better at. Data visualization, um, Excel is not just does not scale. That's a good start, great starting point. Um, you can also drop things into Google Earth. Um, there's a lot of ways you can get some basic analysis out of this stuff. But if you want to test 10 different systems over a period of a week, and then take those results and compare it to a similar exercise done in the Pacific Islands six months later, you need to do this at scale. You need to apply good software engineering to it. Um, you need to put program and process around it. Um, so there's a lot of work involved. I mentioned the state of visualization. This is a very simple form of it. Um, this was done with Python. Uh, you can use MATLAB, you can use a lot of things. Um, the take home here though is that I've worked with people that kept sharing a lot of conclusions via Excel spreadsheets and pointing at various cells and saying, this means that the system did this at this time. For the person doing the analysis, that probably makes sense. For everybody else who's looking at that Excel spreadsheet on the screen, it's noise. There's no way of following along with what the person's talking about. We're visual, we're visual learners and putting the information into well-designed graphs is important. Anybody can produce a bad graph. Spend some time doing uh, some discussions with people about how you want to visualize the data so it's actually representing and telling the story that you want to tell. Comparing county U.S. track data, um, I mentioned most of this stuff. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is compare the county U.S. perception to where the UAV was. Um, this is relatively straightforward. If you've normalized everything, if you haven't, it's essentially impossible. Google Earth works. Um, plotting error over time and distance is relatively straightforward. So as much as I am trying to push us all towards a standardized automated system, you can use Google Earth, you can use Excel for getting um, some pretty good understanding of how systems did and not work. So the takeaways that I want to leave you with, that's the definition of the takeaway. Um, figure out what your use cases are. Um, are you going to be able to mitigate a UAV? If not, then you don't even need to worry about the mitigation step or you can choose to deprioritize that. Um, what's the threat? You know, somebody trying to live contraband into your, into your prison, um, is somebody trying to do ISR uh, surveillance over your nuclear reactor? You know, what are the threats you're trying to counter? And make sure that you are selecting systems and generating test cases and generating flight profiles that align with what your use cases are and what you perceive your threat will be. And bear in mind that those evolve. Um, test and represent an environment. So if you are putting a nuclear reactor on a Pacific island, um, I guess there's some benefits to doing that. I'm not too sure who's going to be consuming your energy. Um, testing, this, testing the systems in a mountainous environment or a desert environment isn't really going to be relevant. Similarly, if you've got clear sight lines out for five miles, um, then your detection rains are going to be different and you may be able to use different sensors. So talk through whiteboard, uh, tabletop exercise, all that sort of stuff. Make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of what you're trying to test, what the threat is, what the environment is, and things like that. Select and fly the targets. Um, so there's a period there. So figure out what, again, based on your threat model and your use cases, figure out what the adversary is likely to be flying and figure out how they're going to be flying them. You or somebody working for you or a trusted third party should, should go through the acquisition and operation of those targets. I have seen tests where the vendor brought a UAV to the test and flew their own flight profile. And it, the counter UAS system worked perfectly. Obviously, that's a little bit rigged. And if you just want a general snapshot of does it work at all, great. 
But if you want to know if it works in your environment, you need to control the selection and the, and the operation. If you can operate the system, do so. Um, there's a there's an FAA exercise doing counter US test and validation at five different airports in the United States. One of the interesting requirements for it was that the vendors are obligated to install the system and then walk away from it for a month. So the vendor, the any detection needs to be need to get to the FAA via the system as it's installed. Um, it's not going to get tweaked on site. It's like, oh, wait a second, we didn't properly adjust the sensor for this operating environment, or we didn't understand that you're going to be using fixed wings. That sort of test is really powerful. There are also times that you want the vendor to evolve on site because it's, it's doing test evaluation is great for the vendors to really improve their system. So keep in mind what you're trying to accomplish and what your opportunities are. Um, at a bare minimum, get the vendors to explain how their systems are working and to show you what the user interface is so that you, when information is coming in via the user interface, that you understand it. Um, it's a great opportunity for that sort of information sharing. Um, people travel to the site, you know, take half a day to train everybody on how all the systems work. It's, it's useful. Um, don't run, if you can avoid it, don't run one exercise with just one vendor. Get as many vendors as you can get to the exercise at the same time. That gives you some opportunities to compare and contrast them. They have intellectual property. You need to give them the opportunity to make sure that the other vendors are not learning how their systems work. So do respect their needs as well as yours. But um, if you're gonna, they're gonna go through all the effort to get multiple vendors there, uh, to get to uh, 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 do the exercise, get as many vendors there as you can reasonably uh, support. Don't let the vendors reconfigure and modify the uh, their system during the exercise, parenthesis, without clearly logging it. Um, if they change the nature or the configuration of their system during the exercise and you don't know that, then different results over the course of the exercise may be hard to understand without that context. Um, we had a vendor that changed the orientation of one of their panels and that had significant effect on uh, some of the results. Um, so getting that, just make sure that you document it. Collaborate and share. I'm saying don't sign non-disclosure agreements. You're probably gonna have to sign non-disclosure agreements. And this goes back to what Mike and I were talking early on. So this is me, get a hold of me. Um, since I have a couple extra minutes, I'm gonna show you one quick thing that's sort of related to it. Um, there's a variety of counter UAS systems deployed around Dallas, Fort Worth International Airport and Dallas, Texas, uh, well, near Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, we have data from those sensors over a month's time. Actually, we have got more than that, but this is looking at data from a month's time. We combine that data with ADSB data. And what this shows is all of the times that a UAV came within 2,000 meters of a manned aircraft in this particular area. The red dots are within 750 meters. Um, so, and there are a number of red dots. So, this is one of those examples of there is great value in counter UAS systems, even if all they do is detect, track, and identify. Um, there's no mitigation going on here, but it's helping the FAA and other people who are concerned about the airspace understand what's actually going on so they can make informed decisions, so they can make regulatory decisions. So I would, and understanding how effective the systems are is still important for this. So the take home here is that if you're doing counter UAS work, there is great value in deploying the systems and sharing the data as I am doing here to help everybody understand what's going on. Um, our result produced is this, it's got the call sign of the aircraft, call sign of the UAV, distance, you know, just, just data crunching. So that is the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing and, and turn it back Matthew. over to Mike. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that. They were just uh, very, very insightful. And even on that last screen, the fact that you can filter it to, you know, the different types of distances that they came within airplanes is is so much more important than simply saying we saw a drone um, because you can actually quantify how many actually dangerous or potential risks. If you have a 
let's say FAA report or investigation that comes out, you can match it up with what actually happened. And, you know, we get all those reports time and time again, where someone says, um, you know, I saw a, pl a drone 60 meters below me or, or 40 meters to, to the, the side. But now you can actually put that together and figure out what actually was happening. Yep. I saw in one of your recent drone sec um, reports, you know, there were three close approaches. Um, there are actually more close approaches than we're now documenting where those are happening. Um, and so we can now start um, really taking this through analysis and make it available via platforms such as yours so that people all over the world start understanding what's really going on rather than this secondhand, potentially flawed human observations and saying this is really what is or is not going on. Um, we will be doing this effort for the US FAA uh, starting in June covering 30 airports. So it's just, it's a tremendous opportunity. And I think it's an opportunity for the counter US vendors and their customers to make some of this data available for helping the larger community better understand what's going on. Oh, that's amazing. And, and good luck with that program, because as we know here in Australia, you know, Air Services did a, a gig on 31 commercial airports or aerodromes, and they found in the thousands per month of drones detected around those areas. So the fact that we are reporting, you know, one or two incidents that are made public is very separate to what is not reported or not seen, or they don't know how to report that. And so you're kind of removing that human in the loop where they rely on someone recognizing it and you've just got the data to prove it. So that's that's really awesome. David, I do have some questions, if, if you don't mind. I know we spoke on link before, but um, maybe you can you can short fire some of these and we'll, we'll end up finishing on time. So the first question I had was, who are the potential customers for this type of analysis? And I might actually piggyback it to another one, which is what is the main incentive for a vendor to undertake these tests? Do they pay or does the customer pay? Um, the obvious answer to the first question is that anybody uh, who wants to procure these systems, procure counter US systems should find, either acquire the sort of capability on their own or go to some sort of national or regional um, flight test facility where this capability is present at that facility. Um, you don't necessarily need to acquire yourself, but conducting the, the counter US testing at a site that has this capability um, is really helpful and important. So I would say the test facilities should would be probably one of the best places to acquire it. I think the vendors might want to acquire this capability themselves so that they can do their own testing in-house under their own circumstances so that they can better prepare for the test environment when they get there. So if they have an understanding of how they're going to be tested, then they can spend some time up front making their systems actually perform up to spec before they even get out there. Um, I would, I, we haven't priced this. I haven't even gotten there. I don't want to get into marketing, but I will say that we want to make this as readily available to people as possible so that the testing is occurring. We don't want to make this sort of capability uh, so expensive that it's a barrier to getting the work done. Okay, no great answer. And look, there's there's something else here that might segue into that. And it says, you talked about drone forensics. Is that a separate system or does it fuse the data together with this counter UAS forensic log data you're talking about? Um, digital forensics is oftentimes a variety of tools uh, that are operated by a human via some sort of well-defined process to bring all the data together and then present it. Um, what we're trying to do, what we are doing and have done actually is build a platform that does ingest all that data into a single platform and allows you to investigate data from the drone, from the counter UAS system, from ADSB, from the manned aircraft, all in one platform. So by all means, I believe that um, having that unified uh, look into the data makes the process much more robust and much easier to use. but as a, as a digital forensic practitioner, I will say you should validate and test your tools using other things. So even if you were using our platform or something else like that, you should go get other tools and validate the results. Um, and there'll be times that whatever we produced 
may not solve all the problems. So the answer is you're going to get some of the digital forensics from a couple of different sources. There will always be some amount of humans fusing the data together into some uh, platform that allows them to do the final analysis. Yeah, you don't need to remind me of the the benefits of using NCase and FTK to cross-reference results, you know. So from a forensic standpoint, always using multiple tools. And um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting new space. It's not yet crowded for you and, and this type of product, but maybe in the future. So two quick questions uh, that I'll, I'll go through first. The next says, how can, if you, well, actually, let's put it in the perspective of a counter UAS vendor watching this. How can they make their systems more easier to play with this type of tool in future um, if this becomes mandatory? Um, we as a community need to design a standard C a C2 command and control layer that everybody says we agree to participate in this as uh, low effort to do so. Um, that would define the common formats for representing altitude, bearing, uh, the geospatial reference, WGS84, time zone. It would standardize and normalize all that data. And it would say, here's how you communicate um, with other participating systems. Um, the Medusa and THAD C2 is a very robust, and so those are models. But I think that as a community, we could come up with something that was not terribly difficult to implement. So the level of effort required on everybody's part would be relatively low. Um, and that was a standard. And so if you participate in that, then a lot of the problems that I highlighted during this presentation in terms of collection and normalization go away. And now anybody can plug into it and either contribute data to it or pull data out of it. Mm, okay, brilliant. And the, the last question here is, what question should a customer who's purchasing as a counter UAS ask to determine if something like this third party analysis has been done? Um, ultimately, we uh, somebody operating this type of system, a test facility or us or whoever, um, would produce a certified report. So the system would generate some sort of report and it would have some sort of SHA or some other way of saying, it was produced by this system and the system was configured in such and such a way. And then there would be a sign off by some human saying, I, David Kovar, certify that we use this system for conducting the test at this time. Um, I would also recommend that that report, which says we certify these test results, is linked to some sort of document that explains the test environment as well. So there are national certification like the FCC certifies that, you know, electronic devices only emit in certain frequencies, it would be the same sort of process where there is a recognized mechanism for certifying that the tests were done under these circumstances. Yeah, brilliant answers and appreciate the uh, chat we had before. David, just maybe say a, a last thank you um, for coming on and, and helping chat to us about everything and uh, your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for all the great work you and the community is doing. Our pleasure.